Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. I like science. <laughs> he does too. That's Ethan <laughs> Allen. I'm Jay Fidel. I'm the, what am I, the host guest, guest host, and he's the host guest. <laughs> Okay, we both like science. This is likable science on a given Friday, and there's a, so, some interesting things to talk about, worth uh, ruminating about. You know, so we live, we live in a time um, that you know that we hope passes quickly. <laughs> we, we live in a sort of transitional time, and I hope it's better at the end. And um, you know, one of the things, of course, is the midterm elections. Right. And uh, Ethan has found, you know, uh, oh, this is so important that some scientists were elected to Congress, to the House. Yes, indeed. Unbelievable. Yeah. So we need to know what this means, where they came from, why they ran, why people voted for them, yeah. whether they have the chutzpah, you know, <laughs> to actually fight out the good fight in, uh, over science right. in Congress and get us out of the 12th century, <laughs> hopefully soon. Ethan, welcome to your show. <laughs> well, thank you, Jay. Good, good to be here. Always fun to talk to you. Talk to you and I, I love the, the intersection of politics and science. You bet. Is, this is, is what we're doing, yeah. Let, let me just say up front, you know, I don't think that having scientists in politics is like a silver bullet. It, it's, I think you could say it's a necessary condition for good government. It's not sufficient for good government, you know. So many of the decisions that, that we're facing now have science components to them. I mean. Obviously, things like climate change, energy policies, all have huge amounts of science, but even, even other sort of seemingly non-scientific issues, like immigration, right, that is being held up as you know, it's a huge threat to our country. And yet the social scientists who study immigration point out the countries that have had relatively open immigration policies have typically done better. Their economies thrive, their standard of living goes up as compared to countries that really try to isolate themselves and close their borders. So again, the uh, huge array of issues really actually do have science underlying them, and we need scientists, and now we've got some. On your point of social science, I just want to add one thing. Uh, I think everybody in Congress ought to be an expert in something. Right. I, I think they can't all be political, mm, I don't want to say hacks. Right. They, uh, they can't be political uh, you know, agents. They have, they have to be expert in something so they can make a contribution. Right. And one of the interesting points I saw on, 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 a, um, on a link that I got in the mail uh, on immigration is, is this. It's the whole Marshall Plan kind of mentality. We, we are so concerned about a, a, a caravan that wants to come here for jobs and a, a better life. Uh, they come from failed states. Mm -hmm. What the United States should be doing beyond immigration is to reach out to help failed states. And if that means revitalizing the United Nations and its various, you know, uh, limousinary organizations, um, then that's what they should do, just like the Marshall Plan. If you want to stop, you know, the migrant problem in Europe, go to Africa, go to the Middle East, right. and make life better for people. Right. Rebuild their countries. Right. So sh shoot some help down to Honduras, Guatemala. El get, Salvador. Get, get, get rid of the gangs there build their local economies, and the people will stop leaving, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's as it's, simple as that. I mean, again, it, it, it's rather like sort of prenatal care. You know, it's much cheaper <laughs> to invest a dollar in prenatal care than to invest $1,000 taking care of somebody who doesn't get the proper prenatal, prenatal and postnatal care, right? So, right? so if somebody who is a scientist or a social scientist or a doctor, in right. the case of medicine, right. uh, is right. willing to run and, uh, and work, um, you know, in that environment, um, then vote for him. You know, we need to or fill, or her, thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you, and we need to fill Congress with experts of every kind. We do, and it was pointed out in one of these articles that, you know, scientists by their very training and their very nature are problem solvers. That's what, they're, that's what they do, that's what, how they think. It's like, there's, a, there's an issue here, I've got to solve this problem. You know, if you're a scientist or an engineer or a doctor, you're working on that mindset all the time. And that's, yeah, our Congress is facing a lot of problems, and basically we need people in there who are much more concerned with solving the problem than simply grandstanding and making themselves look good or, you know, doing what's politically expedient or whatever. You know? Right, and, right. Yeah. And that may not be consistent with what's happened before. Right. And also, you know, I mean, scientists are not necessarily advocates. Right. I mean, sometimes that's a, a weakness, you know, in the, in the, in the training, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got to find scientists, candidates who are willing to advocate for science. 
as well as just know about it. it it's one of the reasons why I, I wanted to get this whole show, this likable science show going, is to bring scientists on in general to talk in accessible terms about what it is I do and why it's interesting, why it's worth supporting, why the average person on the street should care about their science, because that's what it's all about. Science is not isolated. It's not some arcane discipline that sits off by itself and is immune to the rest of the world. It is shaped and emerges from a culture and society, and then it in turn influences that society. And it, it should be fully part of the process. That means being deeply involved in politics. But yes, scientists are typically not well trained. It's admirable what you're doing, by the way. And, and uh, we, well, we, we I, I taped you, you when you had a panel to this effect at the East-West Center uh, in a scientist's right. uh, symposium. And um, that's what we got to do. And, and you, were, you were really offering some great advice that day. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, at the Eco Days was, was a, great, a great symposium, getting scientists to hone their communication skills and learn how to talk to news media in, in, in ways that are going to grab people's attention. It's, yeah. it's becoming a bigger thing now. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. it's a very good trend. Well, how about talking to the news media now about the actual scientists who were elected on Tuesday of mm -hmm. this week to the House of Representatives? Right. That would be really exciting to know who they are, we need to watch them and encourage them. Yeah? Right, well you can, you can go on of course and there's actually a number of sources to, to find now who they are and if you, whether, whether you're in Illinois or uh, Nevada or um, where else, Pennsylvania, all these different, around, the, around the, the country, different districts voted these various people in and they are pediatricians, they're veterinarians, they're physicists, they're nuclear oh, wow. engineers. Wow. I mean, it's a wide array of people. Interestingly, uh, virtually all of them are Democrats. One, one Republican scientist uh, got elected. Uh, there, there, there's actually now a, a PAC, a support group basically called 314, that supports scientists running for uh, office and actually helps them out raises money for them, you know, helps them produce good materials that That's are going to be accessible. So happy that happened. And, and yeah. But you know, um, it's more than just that they bring their own expertise and serve on the right committees, so those, those committees, uh, you know, have a better appreciation of their own subject matter. It's that they are scientists and they can appreciate science and evidence-based thinking. You said my magic and Examination magic of there, yes. data, right. all that. And so they can, they can tell the rest of Congress um, what's important. And you know, I, I mean, gee, I had a conversation with a, a journalist uh, not too long ago. And he said to me, Jay, what, what is the most important issue in our lives? And I had to think about it. But then he shared the answer, and the answer is global warming. Because if we don't do something about it, it's going to kill billions of people mm. in, not, in the not too distant future. Oh, yeah. No, every, if you talk to people who actually study it, the predictions they were making five years ago are now way outdated, and the predictions of the the, the timeline of the danger is much sooner, the extent of the danger is much greater, and, and seemingly across virtually all of the people who are studying climate change, that's, that's the big take home message is, oops, we were underestimating it before, we were saying it was too far in the future, and we were saying it was too little. And now we're beginning to see it more clearly, we're seeing it coming much faster and much larger, and yeah, its, it's effects are already being felt around the world, and they're only gonna get worse and worse and worse in coming Few years. Yeah. So while you know Trump's uh, press conferences and other machinations suck up all the oxygen from the media, um, what we really need to hear about is the is the is the detail on climate change and how it is coming at us and what what can we do and how can we efficiently rebuild our society to mm -hmm. deal with it and having scientists in Congress could help. Right. I'm not saying it will help in the White House. Right. But it could help at least in Congress. Right. So, I mean, a nice example of that was the hurricane that hit the Florida Panhandle a while ago. And yeah. it hit pretty right on that little town in Mexico Beach. Yeah. And I don't know if you saw that photo of I the, did. the whole area level itself. This one, one house. beautiful home standing. That house had been built by scientific and engineering principles to be nice and sturdy and resistant. It was well, well, had a good solid foundation, deeply embedded, was raised up above flood levels was solidly constructed, had a roof that didn't have too much overhang, so it wasn't going to catch the wind and, and lift off. And that house survived untouched while it everything was around was Amazing. The photograph shows house. the whole neighborhood is flattened. Right. The one house on un the water is standing. Vir virtually untouched, yeah. 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 And, and by the same token, we had a show uh, over the uh, solar farms in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. a year ago. Um, and they used one contractor and one kinds of fastener on one uh, side of the farm. 
and another on the other side of the farm. This happened in more than one farm, by the way. And uh, one side was destroyed right down to the, you know, supports, the, into the ground. Um, the other side was done better with the right kind of fasteners and, and, and practice, construction practices. And it still stood. Right. And in fact, it's still functioning. It, it was never offline. Right. It's amazing what the difference could be if you do it right. Right, exactly. This is you know, good by people who use good evidence-based thinking, as you were saying earlier, and say, hey, you know, this, we've seen this material stands up better. This way of constructing a, a solar panel, home, whatever, is more solid, more secure. Yes, maybe it costs 10% more. But when you get a situation like that, like a, a, a natural disaster, it's oftentimes well worth it, you know? Do we have any idea about whether these scientists who ran for office um, ran for office because they wanted to change the way the government deals with science? I, of course, I, I mean, I have not spoken to any of them individually, but the, the impression I get from reading what, what they've said is many of them ran because, in part, they felt there was a real need to bring some science and some scientific training in, into our legislators, you know, into our leg, leg, legislative bodies. Uh, there's a need, need for evidence-based thinking, need for people who look at a situation with a sort of skeptical eye and say, huh, why are we doing it this way? Yeah, what's going to happen yeah. if we do this what yeah. versus what's going to happen if we do that? You know, let's, let's analyze this rather than just saying, I'm going to go with my gut. I like this one, so we're going this way. Yeah, or, or I'm, uh, I'm corrupt. Yeah. <laughs> represent some special right. interest uh, who like to make yeah. more profit. Yeah, and scientists are not immune from that. There have been very unfortunate cases of scientists who have been, you know, have lavish trips and gifts well, paid that. for. You know, I mean, scientists are people. I so, I mean, it'd be interesting to go back and see how they, they fashioned their campaigns. Right. Because if they were saying, you know, elect me, I'm going to bring science right. and rationality into an otherwise irrational body, that, I mean, that would be interesting. And then if, if that were the case, or even partly the case, then to look at the voters. Right. Uh, and I guess most of these guys were Democrats, except for the one Republican right. mentioned. Um, and the voters voted for them, presumably, on that basis. Right. They wanted the scientific rationality in the, in, the, in the Congress. Yeah, now many of them were pushing issues like health care and saying, you know, let, let's not lose our health care, you know, let, let's be sure we keep good coverage for people with pre-existing conditions, blah, blah, blah. Others were looking at issues like climate change and basically saying, come on, you know, let, let's, let's open our eyes and pay attention to this as a real and significant problem that is facing us indeed by by the uh, judgment of many people, that is that is the big problem facing the globe. You know, uh, if it's, it's a, certainly a challenge if we don't meet it. So, how many were there? Do you have just roughly how many? Uh, were I, there? I believe there are uh, nine sort of professional scientists. Use that term fairly such, broadly. Right. Uh, who, who are now in there. A number of them are women. A number of them are fairly young, which is great because hopefully they'll be in there for some years and be able to rise to seniority levels. And, and some of them may turn into good politicians too and be able to get reelected. You know. Maybe that's one of the, the positive upshots of an otherwise negative experience here, um, to find that people want to have experts, they want to have scientists in Congress. You, you, would hope, you would hope that some of these people will look at like redistricting. There's an issue which would seem, again, to be divorced from science, and yet when you look at some of these odd districts that have been done, you've got to say, why are they making these really funky, strange, twisted, gerrymandered districts, right? There's got to be a rational way to make districts. You could, you could say, let's base them on counties, let's base them you know, on X distance from centers of population. I mean, you, you, there's a number of rational ways you could decide how to make your districts. But it's not by drawing lines carefully to exclude certain groups and include certain groups. That, that's not rational unless, I mean, it's simply political, right, to make sure all your people are in, in or outside of the right boundaries, you know, which is a, a nasty uh, Machiavellian kind of thing to do. Yeah, really. yeah. Oh, awful. Yeah. And um, it's, it's a huge step backward, and I, I like to think, I mean, it, it, my, my, my degree of optimism has actually shrunk over the past year, but I like to think that there's a bright side here somewhere, and maybe it is that uh, people, the electorate in general, appreciate a rational legislator instead of one who's corrupt or belongs, he's in the pocket of someone else. Uh, at, you know, critical thinking. Uh, and higher ideals mm -hmm. and values. That's what we need to see. And we have to get back to it because I think really we lost it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I really think, think we, we need to rediscover that and you know, re, rebuild our, 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 our culture of hope. You know? I mean, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson was, was an advocate of 
education because he understood that for democracy to run well, you need to have an educated populace. You can't have yeah. an, a populace who is being led around like sheep, basically, or yeah. democracy falls apart. Yeah. So it's, it's not just science, it's no. education. It's education. It's people large, who appreciate right. the government, appreciate rationality. Right. Yeah. And that's what we be, should yeah. be shooting for. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, the duty of the citizen is, is to find a candidate like that. Yeah. Know? And again, I mean, we have this democratic system we have set up with these three different branches of government all sort of setting up, set up rather differently it, and sort of balancing each other out. It's a great system. It really has tremendous strengths to it. and. When people try to subvert that and turn it all into sort of run by one branch, the other others being subservient to it, you know that's that's appalling. You know? This is America's greatest test. Yeah. So let's let's take a, a moment and think about that offline, okay. and then we'll come back and talk about some other science that has popped up this week that's worthy of mention. Okay. Thank you, Ethan. We'll be right back. All right. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of New Japanese Language Show on Think Tech Hawaii, called Konnichiwa Hawaii, broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us, where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Ah, we're on a roll. We like science, and science is likable. Rationality is likable, I guess, the bottom line. So uh, Ethan Allen and me, we're talking about science today. We talked about all the scientists who were elected to Congress that, on Tuesday. That was fabulous. But there's more. <laughs> let, let, can, we, can we talk about, um, you know, uh, the gut reaction? <laughs> Let's call it uh, finding out what's in your gut. This is a Stanford piece that you sent me, a very interesting piece. Sure, it, it was a nice, a nice example. So we all know that basically hospitals are dangerous places. You go into hospitals and you acquire these infections and get very sick and many people die. And really, uh, it, is, it certainly is true that a lot of people who go into hospitals then after they're in the hospital develop these infections. And for years we have thought, indeed we have sort of known, these infections are because, well, there's lots of sick people in the hospitals that are sneezing, they're coughing, they're blowing germs around. People aren't always washing their hands. Hospital staff maybe aren't quite as careful as they should be. You know, so there's a thousand reasons why these pa patients are getting these infections, right? But it turns out now they have, they have tools where they can trace the bacterial sort of heritage that's making you sick. They can pull these bacteria out of your bloodstream and say, these ones are really, they belong to this class or this group or this subgroup, and they're not this other group. So probably a DNA analysis it, it, of the bacteria. It, yeah, very, very detailed. And what they have found is that a lot of these cases of hospital-acquired infections are actually from the patient themselves. They're bacteria that normally live harmlessly, indeed probably helpfully, in the patient's guts, doing good things in there, and they somehow gotten into the bloodstream, which is not where they belong, and now they're running amok in the bloodstream. But it's not somebody else's bacteria. It is the bacteria from the patient themselves. Now, this is catching. In other words, if so, it comes from my gut. It gets on my body, on, on my skin, right. I guess. It infects me. Um, does it go to infect the next guy or the, or the health worker? Well, what what this study says is the odds are the guy in the next bed is probably getting sick from their own from their own bacteria, <laughs> much more likely than from yours. You're going to spread to them. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, the dangers are not really that we're spreading, we're spreading germs around. The, the, for some reason, and it's not yet clear, the dangers are really something about the hospital stay itself is, is okay. causing it, whether it's surgeries or... So we, we have, this is a really right. interesting question. So we have the study from Stanford, mm -hmm. which has a big medical school, as I recall. Right. Um, and they found to some degree of certainty that uh, this, this dangerous bacteria that you wind up getting affected by in a hospital is your own, right. from your own gut. Right. Okay, so then the question becomes, uh, how, and, oh, and it's triggered 
when you go to the hospital. Right, right. That's it doesn't puzzle. happen at home. Right, that's the puzzling part. It's what <laughs> is it about the hospital stay? That, that, so right. they need to figure out in the next right. article <laughs> what triggers it in a hospital or any hospital. Right. This is happening around the country. Sure. What, what happens in the hospital, the hospital experience? But, I mean, it's very similar to what happens when you take a species that has lives in one environment and you move it in across the world into some new environment. And sometimes okay. they absolutely go crazy and go berserk and start taking over everything, right? They're called invasive species. And it's sort of the same thing. And your gut is its own little ecosystem where you're back to your happy living controlled in some nice way. And for some reason they get transported in your bloodstream and it's a foreign environment and there's nothing in there that can really stop them and control them and then they run amok, you know? So, I mean, really, I mean, you, so you have to examine what is the difference between right. the environment in the hospital right. and out of the hospital. Yeah. And, I mean, I, you know, we sat down, we don't have time right now, we sat down, we would make a list of all the things that happen right. in a hospital right. as don't happen outside, we figure right. it out. Right, is it the food, is it some test that people are doing? It's the it, jello, it's, it's the <laughs> jello. <don't. laughs> we can believe it could be the surgery, right? The surgery is the obvious thing. If people undergoing surgery are bleeding, if they're opening up, their guts and things, you know, you can understand, hey, that could happen, but, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, that seems like yeah. an obvious right. one. If you open up the gut, right. Right. Uh, then and it's... So that'll be interesting to see, and they follow through, is it, is it mainly people who have, have gut surgery, basically, this is happening to? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't, they've got a big enough population to tell that, yeah. So how big a problem is this? How, how important is it for, um, you know, the medical community to solve this problem and answer that question? Well, it, it's, it's a non-trivial problem. If you stay in a hospital for more than about two weeks, three weeks, the odds are pretty damn good that you're going to get an infection. You know? Is this and, MRSA we're talking about? Well, not necessarily. It's not necessarily not, resistant. Right, right. But it's a hospital infection. Acquired infection, right. Yeah. And something like 40 to 50% of those, it turns out, are your own, your own infection, basically. You, you, you brought on yourself in some way. You know? Even without answering the question, I wonder if there's something can be done to neutralize right. those bacteria in advance. Yeah. You know, just assuming they're going to get out and get on your right, body. Right, right. Can you tamp down the, the gut bacteria to a lower level so right. there's fewer of them so they can't, so the fewer maybe get, maybe get out? Maybe it's an immunology thing. It, oh, yeah, you know? yeah, very much. You know, it's a hot, hot subject. So we're going to see more on okay. this, I think, because yes. uh, doctors, uh, researchers will want to know. But it's, it's a cute example, I think, of how science is actually sort of self-correcting. Because people do watch data, they pay attention to evidence, and they've realized, like, oops, despite our belief that the situation is this way, that they're getting these infections from someone else, it turns out when we look closely, nope, we see they're getting you these infections think out from of themselves. the box. You know? yeah. you, but you say that uh, self-correcting and it, it looks on itself. This has been going on a long time, Ethan. We only figured it out now. Hey, I didn't, I didn't say it was quick. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on. Okay. Let's move to Samsung. Okay. Samsung announced um, yesterday, or was it today, um, that they had a folding phone. The screen on the phone is folding. How do you do that, and why do you want it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, the answer of the why is pretty clear. It's sort of because if you can't, you can't put a screen that's this big in your pocket, right? Unless you can fold it up somehow. Okay. I mean, okay. uh, bigger screens are better. They're easier for people to read. You can put more information on them. There's a thousand reasons why you like a big screen, but you've got to have that screen be able to collapse to a small size so it's portable. Now, how you do that, uh, you know, I'm not an engineer, so I'm not, I'm not even going to attempt to answer how, how these guys are building these, some of mine are their roll-up versions, and now there's flip-open versions, and whew, who knows? <laughs> it's, 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 you know, when it strikes me, two things. One is, I've seen it before. Mm -hmm. You've seen references mm -hmm. to the, you know, this roll-up screen, mm -hmm. roll-up monitor kind of thing. Um, so this, it's not a big surprise that, that somebody could put it in a phone or make a phone with it. But you know what strikes me is it's, it's more than the screen. It's more than the phone. So why can't I have a roll-up monitor itself? Why can't I carry my computer around? Mm -hmm. You know, the computer actual processing unit is pretty small, mm -hmm. right? And, then, oh. and I, open, I, ro I open the roll and there's a monitor, as big as I want. Right, you, you have, have something like a little cigar Type thing you clip on your pocket, and you, you pull out, you extend it, and then unroll it, and suddenly you've got a screen this big, yeah. you know, sitting in front of you with a keyboard at the bottom that you can yeah. you know, tap on and, yeah. you know, or, and or it, talk to it, instead it, of who, who wants a keyboard, right? You should be able to talk to They can do it on a phone, right. they can yeah. do it on a monitor. Right. Yeah. But there's more. It sounds like, it sounds like one of those <laughs> right. infomercials. There's more, <clears throat> because 
the screen that's on the Samsung has to be, for the marketplace, a touch screen, doesn't it? Right. So the roll, the roll up monitor that I'm talking about, which has got to follow on right. this, also must be a touch screen right. monitor. Right. This is pretty, getting We're, pretty sophisticated right. now. Instead of just having a display, it's also got to have sensors on it that, that, that can track what's going on, wow. what, where, where it's being touched, what, where the motion is, and yeah. This is only the beginning. Right, yeah, this is. But there's more, <laughs> there's more. Yes. So this screen has processing in it. Right. This is not just a, a piece of dead cloth. Right. This is this is actually got electronic processing right. going right. on in the screen. Right. Okay, well, why, why is it limited to the screen? Right. Why isn't the whole damn thing Fold upable and right. roll upable. Why? Right. Why can't I have the whole phone right. be roll upable? Indeed, right. And Ultimately, won't, won't, will your phone be sort of part of the fabric of your screen? You know, right. all, all of the, the chips as they were on the phone. Why just, not? Yeah. So yeah, you have no central phone unit. You, you have essentially a, a reading device that, you know. <laughs> And, and of course, the other end of it is this Bixby app they're talking about oh, yeah. that, that, that is apparently very clever at tracking what you've done, what you want to do, and learning from this, and makes apparently fewer mistakes in most older versions about learning what it is you're actually actually asking it. Huh? Yeah, well, it's, they're trying to beat uh, Siri, mm -hmm. right, on the Apple. And uh, they're making every effort. I mean, up till now, I don't think Bixby was that good. Mm -hmm. Myself, I disabled it, com comes on the Android, um, and I haven't used it, but uh, I know the potential. And I know Siri, some people just mm -hmm. swear by Siri. Mm -hmm. This is at least Samsung's version of, you know, jumping over Siri mm -hmm. and being better than Siri. Right. And, I mean, if it all comes true, I mean, the theoretical, the theoretical possibilities become re real, right. Um, it could be a great assistant for you. Right. Um, but, but there's a whole thing when you get in these AI programs evolve closely in your life, right? Is to, it's almost who is teaching them the ethics they need, you know? I, I mean, you probably saw that, that funny little commercial about when, when they first put Siri in, into, I think it was a, a Toyota commercial, where Siri starts talking to the cop who's pulled the guy over and, and giving the cop all sorts of information. Well, we were going 47 miles an hour in the 25 mile an hour zone. Well, uh, oh, and we coasted through two stop signs back there. And uh, oh, by the by, there's some illegal fireworks in the trunk, too. You know, <laughs> you know is Siri being your friend there? <laughs> well, you know, we must remember, too that Siri is through the net. Mm -hmm. It doesn't live on the phone. Right. It's, it's connected to the whole world, right. Siri, and right. every little phone is connected. And it's the same thing with Bixby, it's connected to the whole phone. Sure. So I can ask it a, an internet question, right. what have you, and get an answer about anything from anywhere. Right. And part of the artificial, I'm sure this is artificial intelligence, right. part of the artificial intelligence here is not only to speak better and listen better, but also to translate that inquiry into a real serious computer query mm -hmm. and come back with serious information. Right. The whole world at your, at your fingertips uh, with Siri or Bixby. Right. So I think phones are going to change. The competition is, is clear. Right. Uh, the, the, the direction is clear. Right. Foldable and brilliant beyond description right. for everybody within everybody's budget and global because everyone will have access, will want access right. to these things immediately. Right. Scary. It, is, it, is, it, does have its, it does have its frightening size, doesn't it? Yeah, and then when you add uh, President Trump's thing through Homeland Security of being able to send a message to 225 million uh, phone, smartphone users mm -hmm. in this country mm -hmm. at will on command and right. tell them stuff right. or motivate them or uh, mobilize right. them, uh, on a given issue, um, it gets scary because our dependence gets greater, and the power of the person who controls who controls the data right. gets greater. Did, did you ever read Stephen King's horror novel Cell? No. Where, where everyone who's talking on a cell phone at some moment suddenly goes berserk. Literally, some some signal gets sent over the cell phone that literally drives them all into these violent frenzies, and it's yeah. only the people who aren't talking on the phones who are sort of left to cope with the, these wild mobs of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, the thing about science fiction is that science fiction is imaginable. You right. can imagine it, and, and anything you can imagine can come true. Right. For example, right now, Ethan Allen, I'm imagining that we're out of time, and the no. show is over. 